You are welcome to Gilgal Christian Center Live Sunday service. If you are joining us for the first time, I believe that you will not leave the way you came. The power of the Spirit of God will impact somebody today in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, O God. We worship you, we honor you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Shout hallelujah. The Lord is good. Are you sure? If you know the Lord is good, jump up and shout seven hallelujah. Today, we're going to be looking at 
how to avoid impulsive decision making. Impulsive decision making. Look, to be impulsive is to act before thinking or to leap before looking. To act before thinking or to leap before what? Looking. Shout hallelujah. I don't know if somebody understands me right now. To be impulsive is to act before thinking or to leap before looking. As a Christian, in whatever capacity, it may fall upon you to make and execute decisions quickly. While the defensiveness is good, is a good attribute, but acting without thinking can lead to reckless, thoughtless choices that can eventually hurt people you care much about. If you leap without looking, if you speak without thinking, you are most likely going to make many bad decisions in life. You have to understand that. Many times because of the circumstances that we find ourselves, because of the people that gather around us, we start making decisions, we start thinking, we start speaking without thinking. We start leaping without looking. And at the end of the day, we regret. Oh, why did I do that? Have you ever made a decision quickly and you turn around and ask yourself, oh my God, I wasn't thinking. Have you ever done that? Yes. Have you ever done that? Yes. I mean, when you find yourself, you, you make a decision quickly, bam, 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 and then like two hours or one day later, I say, oh my God, what was I thinking? It means because you are not thinking. That's your basically. That's the answer to your question. You are not thinking. You were being impulsive. We're going to look at the Bible today. We're going to study somebody today. So go put your Bible. We're going to. I want to give you an example of a man in the Bible that was very impulsive. A very familiar man. My sister, let's start with Peter. There's a man called uh, Peter in the Bible. I don't know how many of you know him. Have you met Peter? You should have met Peter by now. Yes. Through the pages of the scriptures. You should have met Peter. Shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. <coughs> Thank you. Matthew chapter 14. Let's start. I want us to look at Peter. Today we're going to do a bit of you know, Bible study. I'm not preaching today. Because it's something that we need to understand. This is what affects everybody, including me. Even as I'm talking to you, we are prone to impulsive decision making. And that's why we make many bad decisions, bad choices, because of impulsiveness. You see, a young man goes to maybe a bar or club, or somewhere, and you see this lady dressed up. You say, oh my God. They say love at first time, right? This is my dream woman. Immediately you talk to her, propose to her, pop, 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 pop. before you know it, you are climbing uh, the altar and doing wedding. Only one moment that, oh, wait a minute. What was I thinking? You were not thinking. You are being impulsive. Somebody speak to you. Maybe you are angry. You don't look back and say, okay, let me weigh what I want to say. The next thing you do, you then be you take action. Bam, 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 bam. Only one week later, and even before one week, you're like, wait a minute. I shouldn't have done that. But the damage is done already. In your marriage, your husband or your spouse or your wife speaks to you, uh, gets angry or something happened. Instead of maybe taking steps, going out to cool up a little bit and think, you know that most of the time, once you have like a day or two to think about what you did, you will have done things differently. If you have had a day or two to ponder, to sleep over, you realize that you will have done things differently. Because a spouse talks to you or behaves somehow, the next thing you do is to take action. You have to move out of the house, you end the marriage. Some people, maybe you, you are suspecting your spouse having an affair or something. It might not even be true. 
The next thing you do, the next available man is a woman. The next available woman, you grab. Why? You want to pay back. Only for one week later, I say, oh my God, why did I do that? Because as far as you're concerned, that time, you needed to do something to pay back. What happened? You are being impulsive. The guy that used to chat with you on Facebook or on the on message or whatever, because now is the paper, you call him up. Can we meet? What just happened? You're angry, you want a paper. Only for a week later, or even before, you realize that I, I made a mistake. I should not, the damage is already done. Impulsiveness. We can go on and on and on and on. You are a child. You behave. Instead of finding a solution like in this country, you know the next thing they do? They throw him out of the house. You think you want to be a man or a woman? Get out. And the child is just 17 years old. 17, maybe 16. Where do you expect him or her to go? We can go on and on about the possibilities in this young man. That's why we fail most of the time. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22, my battering on. Let's just continue reading. You talk about, let's take a look into the life of Peter. Open the Bible. Matthew 14, verse 22. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship mm. and to go before him unto the other side, while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent the multitude away, he went up into the mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. Mm. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, mm. saying, It is a spirit. Mm. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spoke unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter. Now listen. And Peter, all the, of all the disciples, everybody saw Jesus walking and they were scared. Mm -hmm. And they asked God, I, Is it really you? Jesus said, Don't be afraid. I am the one. Now look at what Peter did. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, mm -hmm. if it be you, Bid me come unto you on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Mm -hmm. But when he saw the wind, Is that when he saw? The wind blotted, mm -hmm. he was afraid and began to sink. Let's stop there. I want to understand something here. Is it that this wind just started when Peter entered the water? You don't answer the question. I see, I see where people are starting today. Oh. It's not that the wind just started when Peter entered the water. No, no the wind had always been there. There was storm going on. Why didn't Peter see? Because he was not thinking. He jumped up. He was the first. If you're the one, just tell me to come. He said, of course, you, you come, I'm the one. He came in. As he was going, he went, oh my God, there's God. He started to sing. He acted before thinking. He acted before thinking. And that was why he started to sing. When he came to think, Look, if I believe me, I seen the wind, the storm, the way it was going, he thought about it, and still entered. Because that is entry with faith. He will have entered and walked through till. Exactly. But he wasn't thinking. He jumped in. When he started thinking, was when he realized that the storm had started seeing. But of course, not like that. You don't sit down to analyze anything. There is storm already coming your way. There is storm in your life. I 
you are taking decisions that will magnify the storm. That will even make the storm greater. Only for you to turn around later on when you have come to realization to stop blaming yourself. I wish I did. Matthew 16, verse 21 to 30. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes, mm. and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Now listen, the Bible said Peter started to rebuke Jesus. Oh. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Saying, be it far from you, Lord. This shall not be unto you. Then he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> you are an offense unto me. <laughs> For you savor not the things that be of God, but those that are of men. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. This is been a day. He is been with Jesus that Jesus has explained to them what is going to happen, how he's going to pay the price, suffer, the persecuted, and finally on the cross. Gilgal Christian Center, weapon is rolled away. Why do you say that? What happened to him? You don't know what everything Jesus was teaching him. He didn't get it. Many of us are like Peter of today. This was Jesus that we talk about. He did not be teaching the examples that they didn't get it. I don't know how, what pastors need to do for you to get it. They said Peter rebuked Jesus Christ. And what did Jesus answer? He said, can you get you said that? He was speaking before he could think. Because they had time, or if you have taken time to think about the message Jesus gave, he would not have said what he said. But of all, we don't take time. We talk about information. We can get information if you don't analyze it, you're going to make impulsive decisions. So even getting information is not enough. You must get the right kind of information and take time to analyze the information. You, even what you are hearing is, is for you to take time and digest what you are hearing, the word of God, before the word of God will begin to make meaning in your life. Otherwise, you are going to act before thinking. Impossibleness. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Look at Mark chapter 9, verse 2 to 6. Mark chapter 9, verse 2. And after six days, Jesus took with them Peter and James and John and led them unto, up into the high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. Mm. And his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, mm. so as no fuller on earth than whitened. And there appeared unto them Elijah with Moses. Mm. And they were talking with Jesus. Mm. And Peter answered and said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Look at my brother. What did Jesus answer him? For he knew not what to say, for they were so, so afraid. Now, now he said he did not know what to say. Please put a pause there. The Bible said, at the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, you know, Jesus took Peter and two other disciples. And when they at the, at the mound, they said there was a transfiguration. Elijah appeared, Moses appeared, plus Jesus. Their raiment was as white as snow, they could not even see. This was to manifest the power of God before their eyes, to know that this one is not ordinary. And they were afraid, they did not know what to say. If you don't know what to say, shut up.
Now, what did our brother Peter say? He said, ah, Jesus. Let's make three things. You don't know what? Peter was ready to live there. Forget about the other world. Let's live here. You don't know what? Like I said, nothing Jesus did enter into that guy's brain. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Matthew chapter 26, 31 to 35. Matthew 6, 26. Yeah. Then says Jesus unto them, All you shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. Mm. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of you, yet will I never be offended. And, he, and Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, that this night before the roster crows, you shall deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with him, yet will I not deny him. Let's like stop there. Let's stop there. We know the familiar story. Yes, Jesus explained to them that once he's arrested, there will be commotion. Because as the shepherd, when the shepherd is taken out, the sheep will scatter. And people will start denying me. What did our shepherd say? Jesus, even if everybody here denies you, I will not deny you. Did he even think, did that man think before he started talking? No. He was very, very quick to speak without thinking. What did Jesus answer him? He said, even the you, before the cock grows, you will deny me three times. Because they are taking time to digest what Jesus was saying to them. He would have understood that the calamity that is about to befall them would be so great that if you don't take time, you will deny Christ. But he didn't take time. He did not analyze what Jesus was saying. All that he wanted to say was because he wanted to be seen. This man, apart from being also spiritual, I believe that Peter was a man that wanted to be seen at all times. Let's read that one. The Bible did not say that. But I can tell you that is also my own speculation. Based on the action of our brother Peter. Shout hallelujah. Finally, let's look at John 18, verse 1, 2, something play. We can stop somewhere. John 18, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken this word, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where was a garden into which he entered and his, and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place. For Jesus often time resorted uh, thither with his disciples. Judah then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, coming hither with lanterns and torches and weapons, mm -hmm. Jesus therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, you know, went forth and said unto them, Whom ye seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon as he had said that unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Then asked he them again, Whom seek ye? And he said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way. <clears throat> then said, sorry, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke of them which he gave me. Have I lost none? Then Simon Peter, mm -hmm. having a sword, drawn it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off the right ear. <laughs> the servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put your sword into your sheath. The cup which my father has given me, shall I not drink it? Let's stop it. Shout hallelujah. We see Peter again in his action. It's not mad nature. Of all the disciples, even though Jesus has spoken several times, told them what's going to happen, told them the reason why he came, what did Peter do? He brought a sword and cut off the ear of that, uh, that messenger. What happened? Impulsiveness. Impulsive decisions. I'm bringing this out to tell you that even children of God go through 
impulsiveness in their decision making. You have seen in the Bible how Peter was so impulsive. Doesn't mean that God was not still using him. God was using him. But you understand the grace Peter has. Or how you might not have that kind of grace. Peter was working with Jesus quite face to face. In other words, he was working with God face to face. And God was protecting him every step of the way. Because there was a purpose that God kept him where he was. But you might not have that kind of grace. I believe that some of us were in the shoes of Peter making such a positive decision. Maybe some of us would have died by now. The fact is this. I bring this out to, to let you understand. Being religious, going to church, being a child of God does not prevent you from impulsiveness in decision making. But all you need to do is to try to minimize, to try to control. Because when you're impulsive, you don't think. When you're impulsive, you don't reason. When you're impulsive, you think it's all about you. You only realize later when the damage is done. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. We are talking about how to minimize. How to minimize uh, the possibility of making wrong decisions. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. In more ways than one, as believers, we make decisions based on impulse. We make decisions based on impulse. Or how we feel. Instead of making decisions based on the end goal or the kind of harvest that we desire. One thing that drives goal shaping decision is your state of mind. Understand this. Your state of mind at that particular time when the decision is made. I want you to understand this. Your state of mind drives your decision making process. The way you feel that time drives your decision making process. The state of mind is called emotion. Emotion. When you allow emotion to take a better part of you, when your state of mind is not stable, you are bound to make impulsive decisions that will put you in trouble. Your state of mind stimulates the decision that you make. For example, when you feel really excited about something, you are more likely to underestimate the risk. When you are very excited about something, there's a great likelihood that you are going to underestimate the risk. You know what? You don't take time to weigh the risk because you are excited about something. Whether it's about somebody that you just met, about a new job, about whatever it is that you are so excited about, you're going to lack the capacity to weigh the risk, the pros and cons. When you are anxious about something, it's going to be called the ability to think rationally and may likely spill over to other areas of your life. When you are anxious, you know, anxiety does not just affect one thing. It has what we call ripple effect. Anxiety. About maybe you are jobless, you are held, you are married, you are children. It's not just going to affect the children. It's not going to just stop at that, that particular point. It's going to spill over. An anxious person is most likely going to make silly decisions regarding other areas of his or her life. Because you are anxious. Research studies have demonstrated that sadness Leads people to minimize expectations. When you are sad, you are most likely going to minimize or reduce expectations. You know what? You not you don't want to set the bar high because you are afraid to fail. You want something to help you feel good. You know what? If you minimize, if you reduce the goal, it's gonna be easy to achieve. And when you achieve this goal, it will make you feel good. You got to realize that that goal is not where you're supposed to be. But you're minimizing it so that it will be easy to achieve, so that it will make you feel good because you are sad. 
That's what we call settle. You just settle. You just accept it. That's it. Because you are sad. You settle. <laughs> you want to make up. You want to make it so that if you can achieve this small one, at least it will make me feel good for some time. I know if I go higher, it might be difficult to, to achieve. And you serve because you are sad. Establishing no expectation for yourself can preclude you from attaining your ultimate potential. That's the truth. That's why many of us do not attain our ultimate potential. Why? Because of the, the our state of mind will reduce expectation. Make it easy to achieve. If you're angry, discouraged, stressed out, then you're likely going to make rash decisions of your life. I said it before. Because of anger, because of how you feel, you can walk out of marriage. Many marriages fail today. You have divorce today. Many of the reasons that the marriage is found could have been resolved easily but because of anger. Something that you have taken time, maybe after like a week. If you had a long time, maybe two days or three days, and tried to cool off, that marriage would still have worked. But because of anger, the next thing you do, you walk out, and that's the end. Or the next thing you do, you walk out, look for another man, look for another man to sleep with, because you want to pay back. By the time you realize the one that's sleeping with you, oh my God. Why did I leave my husband and go to this guy? <laughs> and before you know it, your husband finds out, or your wife finds out, so the marriage ends. And even the one that you went to do that thing one time with, you don't want to do it again. But you already lost your marriage. What happened? Anger. Rash decision. Some, of, some people, because of something happening in the church, the next thing you do, I'm not going there again. You walk out. You tell people, that's it. I don't attend that church anymore. But a week later, you don't have the face to come back because you already told everybody, I can't go there anymore. But you want to go back. <laughs> some of you should know that it's happening even in this church. You want to go back, but the face is not there. Come on. You got to read to everybody. Ah, that pastor. I don't want to. What happened? Anger. Some of you miss where God has placed you to fulfill destiny in the church right. because of anger. Mm. But if you are confident, positive, motivated, you are likely going to make better decisions. When you are very confident, very motivated, very positive, believe me, the decisions God have made are going to be better decisions. State of mind detects the decision that you make. Your state of mind drives your decisions. Therefore, since your state of mind impacts the decisions you make, it is very crucial, therefore, to understand what brings about a particular state of mind. What brings about your state of mind? You need to understand that. So we now can establish that your state of mind drives your decision-making process. Then the first step to understanding the kind of decisions you make, the first step to minimizing that, uh, the possibility of wrong decision is to understand uh, what brings about uh, a particular state of mind. What brings about that state of mind? Whatever you set your mind on, whatever you focus on continually, is going to drive that thought process. Underline that. Whatever you set your mind on, what you focus on continually 
It is going to draw your thought process. That is why it is important to hear the advice in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Read again. I want everybody to pay. Don't read the Bible. Let them only read. And you pay attention. They we're talking about what you focus on continually will drive your state of mind. We said earlier that your state of mind drives the decisions that you make. And what drives your state of mind is what you focus on continually. What you pay attention to. That is what drives your state of mind. And to be able to understand your state of mind, you need to heed the warning in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Go ahead. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, Think on these things. Say, think, think on these things. If there be of any virtue, if there be of any praise, what is virtue? We then we virtue during Bible study. What is praise? If that thing is of virtue to you and to God, if that thing is of praise, it will bring glory to the name of God. That thing is the Bible says, think on those things. When you focus on those things, it automatically, or they automatically, will galvanize your state of mind into action. And the decisions you're going to make based on what you focus on. Because these things that the Bible talks about will make you motivated, will make you very confident, will make you very positive. These things that you focus on, they're the things that will motivate you. There are things that make you confident about who God is and what God has for you. Even when you are in the valley, yeah, that is the time you're going to make positive decisions. Your thoughts will define how you feel, which is going to affect your state of mind. We look at Proverbs chapter 4, verse 22. Let's read that one, please. Look at Proverbs chapter 4, verse 22. Proverbs 14. Your thoughts will define how you feel, which is going to affect your state of mind. For they are life unto those who find them, and health to all their flesh. Mm. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. For your mind to function properly, to be able to act on the things that are honest and pure, whatever that is lovely and whatever that is of good report, you must avoid conformation with the world. Conformation. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 to 3. You must avoid conformation with the world. While renewing your mind continually, there's a lot of you know, pollution going on in the world. We talk about a state of mind. To even be able to focus on the things that are pure, the things that are lovely, the things that are true, the things that are of good report, the things that carry virtue, the things that carry price, you must continually renew your mind. Why? Pollution is happening every second. You turn on the TV, it's pollution. You go to YouTube, Facebook, pollution. The people you come in contact with, pollution. Even if you don't take time. And this pollution will make it difficult to focus on the things that are good, that are pure, that have virtue, that carries praise. That is why Romans chapter 12, verse 2 to 3, is very critical. Romans 12, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world. Listen carefully. But be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, mm. that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Mm. 
For I pray, through the grace given unto, unto me, to every man who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Let's stop there. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Do not conform to this world. Do not. I saw something online. I posted on my Facebook. I don't think maybe somebody has not even read it. I don't see people commenting on it. You know why? Because it's not worldly. Somebody wrote an article in the newspaper about the difference between uh, not different. About similarity between President Obama and President Biden. But it focuses on the area of gay movement. Let me not go into that. But he right, he, in fact, for the first time, was able to analyze what is going on today in the world and what America is doing to Africa. You know, now they are threatening, even this presidency, threatening African countries to pass gay right laws. Otherwise, they will deny them help. You understand that? Even Nigeria. They are now putting pressure on Nigeria to pass the law to recognize gays and lesbians uh, yeah. and whatever you call it. Otherwise, they will deny help. What just happened? Pollution is entering. That's why when we preach, it's not about political party. It's about, because I know whatever something affects you, your self interest, you can never even reason rationally. You won't even remember the word of God at all. Because it's all about what you want now. The word of God can go to hell. When you get what you want, you think about the word of God. But people don't seem to understand what's going on in the world. That's why the Bible says, do not conform to this world. But be ye transformed by what? Renewing of your mind. Without a renewed mind, your state of mind, you will not be able to focus on the things that are pure, the things that are true, the things that are of good report. And if you cannot focus on those things, all other things you focus on will drive the decision making process. And that is why we're making positive decisions. In the renewed mind that is well able to exercise self restraint from taking reckless decisions in the midst of unwarranted provocation. The renewed mind. Such a mind is well positioned to allow the Spirit of God to release messages through that will be needed in the formation of the thought process. Messages. The same here. One of the ways this happens is through spiritual discernment. A person that will quickly seize opportunity as they present themselves is a person who can quickly discern the word for God. Discernment will come. Discernment is the another attribute that will help you to minimize wrong decisions. We're going to stop here. Now I promise that by 11 day, every Sunday we must leave, we must end. No. <laughs> and Mary doesn't believe me. When you say man, no, you mean that you don't believe me. <laughs> you mean that let's watch the let's go and see you. <laughs> you will see. Shout hallelujah. So that's the point. What do you learn about impulsiveness? Do you know what you have lost because of impulsive decisions? Do you know what you have lost in your marriage, in your health, in your career, even in the church, in your relationship with God because you are impulsive? Back in the day where you know, church was church, you want to serve in the house of God, the pastor will put you through hell. Because you must prove yourself that you are ready to serve God. In normal in Africa, I came here, I went to a tutelage under a man of God and a woman of God. When I say, some of you don't understand what I say. My wife and I here. You dare not speak back at the man of God when he speaks to you. You dare not argue when he asks you to do something. You are not putting your best in and out. Because when you are serving the church, you are serving God, not about the man of God. But here, when you even talk to 
brother and sister. In case not the key, we'll just throw the key at your face and walk away. Impulsiveness. And that's how they miss their blessings. Can you correct a brother or sister when that person is doing wrong in the church of God? And will they heed your advice? No, they get what? Angry. Impulsiveness. And they don't know that they are losing a lot. Because of impulsiveness in the show making. I am talking this to somebody, to you, to you, to you, to you. Even those that might be listening to me online. Guide your heart. Guide your mind. And get yourself ready. Focus on the things that are true, that are lovely, that are of good report, that carry virtue, on the things that bring praise to the name of God. If you must, purify your mind. Don't conform to the world, but be transformed by renewing your mind if you must be able to avoid the impossible issues. You have nothing. to God right now. I don't know how the message of today has impacted your life. I, I cannot speak for you. I can only speak for myself. Tell the Spirit of God to help you. You want to minimize the possibility of making wrong decisions. Because wrong decisions have robbed you of so many blessings of God. Wrong decisions have kept you hostage. Wrong decisions have made things that are not supposed to come your way to start coming. But ask God to forgive you when you have gone wrong. And ask for the direction of the Holy Spirit. You need to study the word of God to renew your mind. You need to start focusing on what is true, what is, what is praiseworthy, what can be virtue, what is of good report, what is lovely, what will bring glory to the name of God. Praise and adoration to the it's going to cost you something. It will cost your time, your money, your resources. It will cost the time you're going to need to sit down to pray. It's going to involve taking risk for God. And the God of heaven that honors his word more than his name. That is not ignorant of your labor. Ah! It is right here. Manda Robo Shari Bokumba. Ah! It's not ignorant of your labor. It is my dear. That God. That God that is our rewarder. That can never forget. The king could remember more than God after many years of forgetfulness. And the king was a man. Our God is not a man, he can never forget you. Is there even God a mother can forget a child, a suckling child? I have engraved you the palms of my hands, I will never forget you. God will remember you. When you have any reason to call upon his name, when you ask him for help, he will stand up for you. As you labor in his mind, your God will labor for you. Thank you, O oh God. May God bless your holy name. Have your way. We commit this way into your hands. What see people for destruction will not see this one. Amen. What kills people will not kill you. Amen. What inflict people with sickness will not inflict you. Amen. Ah, the arrows of the enemy will not look at you this way. Amen. Ah, you're walking into victory. Amen. You're walking into good health. Amen. You're walking into promotion. In the name of Jesus Christ. I know.
just honor your wings, O oh God. In these evil days, I offer you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for testimony. We worship and we honor you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. One, two, three, go. Gal Christian Center, 4416 Monroe Road, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28205. Gilgal Christian Center, where burdens roll away. Gilgal Christian Center, a deliverance and prayer ministry.